Welcome to the Explore Wars Discover Worlds podcast, presented by Bradford Literature Festival. In this episode, join Dr. Adrian Marsh, a leading Romani traveller, academic and researcher in Romani studies, as he explores the history and impact of Romani and traveller literature and poetry. Recorded at the Bradford Literature Festival, discover the remarkable significance of Romani and travel literature. Good evening. Um, I'm Dr. Adrian Marsh. I am Professor of Romani Studies. Uh, I'm mostly associated with the Swedish Research Institute in Istanbul, because I live in Istanbul. I also live in Baku, in Azerbaijan. That's that bit up at the top of the Caucasus, just next to the Caspian Sea. I've worked in lots and lots of different countries around the world with different Romani communities from the Dom people down in Cairo all the way through to the Mugats up in Azerbaijan all the way through to Irish travelers uh, to Rea Sander in Sweden. Um, I am also Welsh Gypsy. I was born in Cardiff in 1961 and I'm from a Romney and Irish traveller background. My father's people are Irish travellers from County Longford. My mother's people are Greek fortune tellers, the Stavrianuses, and um, Gitanos, Spanish musicians, a uh, mixture. Ended up in the south of England in the late 19th century. So by training, I'm an Ottoman historian. Uh, so I am a historian and I got involved in Romney studies as a way of trying to explore both my heritage and my family's heritage and the hidden history of my people, our people. Because we don't know our own history very well and non-Romani people know even less about our history. There's been an upsurge in publishing recently in the last decade, an upsurge in publishing books about gypsies, the history of the gypsies, the secret history of the gypsies, gypsies of Eastern Europe, etc., etc., etc. Um, some of them are written by well-qualified academics and some of them are written by populist authors. A few of them are written by community members, especially the ones which tell stories about evangelical journeys. Many Romney people are finding their way through the evangelical Pentecostal church to be able to express themselves in different ways. Very, very many of them, though, are filled with the kind of stereotypes and negative images fair degree of prejudice and a lot of misinformation. Sadly, I can't share with you the three minutes of Thousand Years of Romney History in Three Minutes video, uh, which is a short animated history of Gypsy Roma travelers, but it's on YouTube, have a look at it. Um, but we are from India in origin, not Egypt. So just to establish that, we are from India a thousand years ago, northwestern, north central India, originated as peoples who were captured by Muslim invaders, taken back to Ghazni in what's now Afghanistan, and there served as slave soldiers for the Ghaznavid Empire, and were incorporated within the military machine, large Muslim power state. When that state fell in the west, it occupied an enormous area all the way to the borders of Anatolia. When that state fell in the west to the Seljuk Turks from Central Asia, the long journey west of the ancestors of the Romani people began. And the next time we find them having traveled through Anatolia, arriving at the court of Constantine the Ninth Monomachus, he who fights alone, emperor of the Romans in Byzantium, Constantinopolis. And there, our ancestors arrived not as Hindus, as one might expect, but they arrive as people speaking a language which nobody around them understood, but practicing magic, fortune telling, divination, bear leading, variety of acrobatics, these kind of things. And the thing about what happened in that period is that the Byzantines were extremely interested in the origins of magic. Byzantine society was a very orthodox society, orthodox Christian, Eastern Christian, strongly orthodox. The emperor was not only emperor, he was the head of the Orthodox Church, God's appointed. 
And the interest in Egyptian magic was such that well-known intellectuals like Michael Selos, who was a kind of grand vizier, uh, Chartophyrax is the Greek word for it, he was somebody who was investigating the origins of magic, both through the Bible, as in the people from, uh, who were, are Pharaoh's magicians in the story of Exodus, and also through the kind of history of Chaldean magic and, and various different things. All magic is supposedly coming from the Bible, and the people who practice magic were Egyptians, so therefore an unknown brown-skinned group of people who turn up speaking an unintelligible language must be Egyptians. Hence, gypsies. It's a contraction. So that's the kind of first point we find them in history. They stay for four or five hundred years from the middle of the 11th century until the Ottomans conquer the, uh, the Byzantine Empire in 1453, May 1453. And with the fall of Byzantium, two things happen. One is it sets off, it triggers a mass migration westwards. There's been trickles beforehand, but the mass migration westwards. The other is that a whole group of what are now definable Romani people with the Romani language, they have emerged, they have become about in the same way as many other communities are coming about in the early modern period, not least the English. Uh, many of them stay, and they become part of the Ottoman Empire, part of the army, part of the foundries that make the cannons, part of the system of haulage, basket makers, etc., etc., but also entertainers. This is where we first find music and dance associated with Romani people. Byzantium not. There's very little popular music in Byzantium. Lots of religious music, but the Egyptians did not perform for public consumption. So we have a kind of different evolution now. We have one in the east, which is in the Ottoman lands, one where there isn't slavery, where there is guilds, Romani people join guilds, basket makers become extremely wealthy. They build a small palace on the shores of the Golden Horn, which is still there, it's lovely, um, which they give to Ibrahim I, the Sultan. They are that wealthy. The dancing guilds filled with young Romanis, boys, of course, girls don't do that dancing in public. And the musicians, the orchestra, Romanlar Orchestra, Romanlar is the Turkish word for Romani. They become part of the palace system of entertainment. There is a neighborhood which specifically caters to top Karpa, the sultan. So they become an intrinsic part of that society. However, they are still second class because they are suspect because they are musicians and dancers. They're also treated as not proper Muslims because they used to be orthodox under the Byzantines. In the West, we have slavery in the Romanian lands. We have discrimination, persecution, and by the time we get to the 18th century, we have gypsy hunts, we have draconian laws in Britain under Henry VIII and Edward VI and Elizabeth, uh, where you can be hung for being a gypsy. Um, and we have a kind of diaspora going through British Isles, Scotland, into the Scandinavian lands. So Romani people arrive in Stockholm around 1525. They arrive in Helsinki in Finland, three or four years later than that. So by this time, the Romani population is spreading. They go down into Spain, where they become largely intermixed with some of the original nomadic peoples who are already in Spain. So this is where we get this complexity about who is Gitano, who is Mechero, who are the people who live in caves, who are called Quinqui. But there are strong musical traditions that are taken down into Spain. And this is where, of course, Spain gets its flamenco. Flamenco is that mixture of Romani music from the east with, for, with musical forms that originally come from Berber, Makans, and, and um, the kind of modes that come from North Africa. And it's that combination, ornamented singing from, from the Ottoman lands, etc., and the forms of music from North Africa. By the time we get to the 19th century, we have what is effectively a, a growing interest because of interest in the Orient, ex-Orient looks, light rises in the East. Scholarship in Europe is fascinated by the East at this point, largely because of colonialism, of course, the British having conquered India, but the Germans and others also scrabbling for territories. 
and people trying to find the route through to China for the spices, etc., and trade the silk and all of that. And the Central Asian game, the Great Game, as it was called often, was about control of these regions. So interest in the East is at a very high point. And of course, you have explorers, people like Sir Richard Burton and others, who are trying to find their way through various different parts of what is the unknown world, at least to Europeans. Uh, Burton is one of the first people who takes a strong interest in the gypsies, as he calls them, and works out along with Owen Jones, the jurist, also judge in India, but a fantastic uh, linguist, linguistic scholar. They work out that the origins of Romney language is in Sanskrit, and that it is something that feeds through and changes around 1000 AD from three genders to two genders, from old Indo-Aryan to new Indo-Aryan. Therefore, the people who we know, who they knew as gypsies in Britain, must have left India around 1000 AD. So that's how the timing has all worked out. Unfortunately, alongside this kind of interest in folklore, ethnography, collecting language, collecting stories, interviewing people, we also have a growing interest in eugenics, Francis Galton, etc. Gypsy Law Society is founded in 1889. Francis Galton starts to publish his work around the same time. And as we get into the early 20th century, we get writings in the German lands. Back in as early, actually, as 1911, we get the phrase, lives unworthy of life, being published in a German study of gypsies, where they are described, Zigoina, where they are described as lives unworthy of life. That's the first time that is used. It gets repeated in um, Koch and Hofner, uh, their book in 1920, which is about jurists, how jurists should treat criminal cases, and describing the kind of criminal classes in the German lands. And they repeat this notion of why it should be justified to be able to, with certain groups of hereditary criminals, why it should be justified to enact this doctrine of lives unworthy of life. Also in Spain, there's a fair degree of hostility and antagonism, which increases through the late 20s and early 30s. And then, of course, we get the period of the Nazi racial state, 1933 to 1945. And that begins the road to Avenus, as you call it. Avenus is the old uh, Roman Empire name for hell. It's where Hades is. And the road to hell starts with the uh, arrival of the of Hitler. There is an infamous document similar to the 1C proclamation, though some two years later, in which Himmler calls for the final eradication of the Zigoina. And people like scientists like Robert Ritter and Eva Justin were going around Germany before the war, cataloging, measuring bones, measuring heads, all of this kind of stuff. They worked for a specific department of the Office for Racial Hygiene. 1938, 39, gypsies have their zigoina, have their documentation removed, taken away from them. They are no longer uh, able to marry outside of the community. They're no longer able to um, attend school. And many of them are part of the armed forces. Like Volta Winter, a very famous Roma, um, Roma person in Germany, who wrote a book about surviving Auschwitz. Uh, he was kicked out of the German Navy. He was a lieutenant at this point because of his background. Very famous German boxer, Johann Trollmann, nicknamed the tree because he was very strong. And he had a particular style of fighting which we see echoed with Muhammad Ali, actually. He was the first one to develop that bouncing around the ring because German boxing was about standing toe to toe, toe to toe, and then hitting somebody as hard as you could, but not moving. He didn't do that which the Nazis thought was most ungentlemanly. So they banned him when he won the World Lightweight Championship, 1936. They banned him from the German Boxing League. Sadly, eventually he was murdered in one of the death camps. We have that awful period of the complete destruction of Romani people, which we call the Paraimos, or O Baro Paraimos, which means the great devouring. Baro is big, Paraimos means consuming everything. And the argument that scholars make is that 
in terms of the Romney body, both symbolically and actually, Romney people were completely and entirely consumed. In the same way and for the same reasons of race that Jewish people were. So these two groups of people are the only two groups of people who the Nazis targeted on the basis of specific race and their ethnicity. The destruction of European Roma and Sinti communities is enormous, probably about three quarters of the total population, which at that time would have amounted to around five million in Europe. Most, most of them did not die in concentration or death camps. Most of them died actually as a result of Einsatzgruppen group and SS death squads that would patrol the streets. Uh, and the Romney national anthem, Jelem, Jelem, I came, I came, sings about meeting the black legions upon the road who've taken the family, taken my family away from me. It's a reference to this. It's a reference to these episodes. So, after the war, there is a period again of separation where the communist countries try and incorporate Romney people within the new Soviet man and woman project. So there's an interest in literature and there's an interest in developing Roma um, poetry and folklore and dance. It's state supported for a while. Um, and in the West, the Romney Holocaust is largely ignored. People are turned away, they're liars. Surely not. And the first successful case for reparations isn't actually paid out until the 1980s in Germany. So for a very long period of time. People write memoirs. Walter Winter is one. Otto Rosenberg is another. There are many others. There are even very good graphic books, as in books with you know, graphic illustration, um, by Sophia Tycon from Sweden. So it's accessible in many ways. It's just that it is not something that people know about. Um, and it leaves a deep and abiding trauma, which leaves a complete distrust of the non-Romani people, the gorges, the gadget, uh, in the heart of Romani people and Romani communities across the world, because we all remember it, we all know what it happened. Many of us had relatives who, or distant relatives who were part of it. So we come into the modern period now when we're widely dispersed, largest minority ethnic community in Europe, 12 million in Europe. In the country I live in, in Turkey, largest population of Romney people in total, four and a half million Romney people in Turkey. Uh, next largest is Romania with two and a half million. But by now populations have also begun to, again, with the collapse of communism in the East, have begun to migrate around. So we're getting a greater intermixing again after centuries of distance and separation. Communities have begun to talk to each other again. Romney chows, that's the word we use about ourselves, Welsh gypsies, English gypsies, Romney chows, are getting to meet Roma again and we are finding out what's your word for this, what do you say for that, are you Muslim, are you Christian, some of us are Pentecostal, you know, these kind of things. We're starting to exchange. So, we are greeting each other. One of the things that comes out of modern Romani interaction is Romani poetry, Romani literature. Romani poetry is, has its origins in the bardic traditions, in the sense that Romani people in the late medieval and early modern period would be entertainers across Europe, always have been. One of the things we did, along with metalworking and basket making and all of these kind of things. So one of the ways in which we would entertain is, of course, through the sort of bardic recitation, almost epic poetry, if you like. So I like to think that there is a direct connection with the epic bardic traditions that other communities inherit in the Balkans, like the Turks, with their epic poems that they recite, or in the Yugoslav lands, where, again, there's this strong tradition bards who recite epic poetry. And of course, ultimately, all of that goes back to Homer. We now are in a position where people are writing it down. People are writing poems down. And this growth of Romney poetry, written Romney poetry, has really flowered in the last decade. Uh, and I'm going to read you the first poem that I wanted to share with you. And this is about trying to come to terms with that 
change and shift in identity and movement and migration, and what it's like to lose some things and gain others. This is new Rom. Who are we? Roma without Romaness. Who must read our own history in another tongue. Follow the butterfly of our own being across maps of imagination, trying to recreate the lost structure of our soul. We are your children, you who fought battles, traded metal, horses, dreams and tongues in order to survive, who told the magnificent lie and ended up in chains as galley slaves, deportees, outlaws and brigands, in ashes and in lime. If we learn Romanesque from books and not our mother's breast, it is only because the long cloak of assimilation, the rubber stamp of jackboots, and the mask of shame almost destroyed the butterfly's fragile wings. If we travel in aeroplanes rather than Bourdon, it is because our journey has taken us so far apart. We read the future from a fax machine and not a crystal ball. If we reconstruct history from dust and ashes, it is because this dust came from our own feet and the ashes from our bones. That's by Jimmy Story, an Australian Romney chow, Australian gypsy, originally from England. He uses some Romney words in there, vodon or vado, it's originally an Armenian word, and it means wagon, and it's the painted wagons that are very much part of traditional British Romney experiences. Uh, also Polish, actually. Polish have painted wagons. Central European Roma tend not to have done. They've been settled for much longer. So Vardo, or Vodon, as Jimmy Story has it, is one of those words. And one of the features of Romney poetry is this attempt to incorporate... Romney words and Romney language, even f quite long phrases, within a structure which is of the majority language. So there is a, a Romney poet, professor of creative writing at Warwick University, David Morley. He has a cycle of poems called Te Aven Angle Tute, which means, Daniel, what does Te Aven Angle Tute mean? Do you know that phrase? It is, it's like that, I lay this, or I lay these words, I lay this all before you. And the cycle of poems is about, uh, it both features his family by the roadside, sleeping under the caravan, waking up in the morning, pouring four-star petrol to start the fire and make some tea. But it also has the kind of, his perspective as a professor of creative writing at one of the premier universities in the UK. So there's this kind of weaving of things in and out. His mother was a fortune teller on Blackpool Pier, for example, and that gets featured in some of his stories. So the stories are still there, and there are parts of stories which both express and are expressionistic in the sense that they are emotional, and they are picture poems, and they are splashes of linguistic colour across the canvas. But then there are also the ones which feature the strong tropes which are about suffering and loss and the, some of the terrible things that have happened and the kind of hold that has over what has over our imagination and how that has to some extent fractured us because we both have to live in the world where the people who were trying to murder us en masse still live and we live amongst our own communities. And we know we can't stay all the time in our own communities. We have to reach out if we're going to make any changes. So one of the tropes is also about the continuation of travelling, even when communities don't travel as much anymore. Although even when you're not on the road anymore, as I was when I was a child, I'm still doing thousands of miles across the entire globe these days. Um, so travelling is still very much, but the limits on travelling are also part of the tropes of Romani poetry and traveller poetry. And Natalie's going to read us a poem about the limits. Natalie. Take away the cruel stone, longer and larger than life, the black, dark stone of envy, death and greed. Everywhere you go, before you turn the wheel, is the black stone you'll meet. 
driving you from the light, taking over your life, ruling over your world, burying you deep. Take away the stone that holds back our freedom, killing the only life we've ever had. Envy stone without a heart, cold and hard, no feelings has it, haunting us travellers every day. A chain of black stones around the green shamrock. What once was ours is no more. Thank you. So that's a poem by Chrissy Wood. She's an Irish traveller and a poet. And in that she's trying to capture with the idea of the black stone, both the kind of black stone which are the remains of people and buildings at, uh, in the death camps, but also the stones that are always put to block traveller access to public land or to cricket pitches or whatever it is. Um, especially in Ireland, but it's also true here, although it tends to be earth embankments that are used in England uh, and in Wales. So the stone for her is a symbol of both the limit on how far we can go and also on where we can stop, which these days is almost nowhere thanks to a recent change in legislation. And also the memory, the stone that sits above us, almost sits upon us, which is that terrible experience of being almost exterminated. So these kind of tropes feature very much. One of the other tropes that feature is, this but is the idea of the butterfly, the fragile nature of the butterfly. Um, and the butterfly is an expression of the kind of briefness of Romney life, traveler life. There was a poet from Poland whose name was Papuja. Uh, she was, um, that means butterfly. She was a poet from her own community, the Begitka Roma in Poland, just after the war. And she had a strong relationship with a writer who was not Romani, Jerzy Fikowski. Uh, and Papuja and Jerzy Fikowski had a friendship which meant that she would recite the poems to him and he would write them down and record them. Sadly, the community rejected that relationship because it wasn't clear, were they married, were they not, what was going on? So for the community at large, we have very strong pollution taboos and cleanliness codes and codes of behavior and morality to keep the community together. They are both functional and ritualistic. Um, for the community, that was not acceptable, either one thing or the other, but you can't be this kind of strange thing. But she chose the name Papuja as a butterfly, and that was a theme in many of her poems. We haven't got a poem about or from her work, but we have got another poem which I would like Daniel to read. Django, who would you be if you were not Django? Like Kos, you are a true gypsy, but you are the greatest. Django, your guitar strums in our heads. Your music gives us hope of living in freedom and grants us the right of the city. Django, when you wander along the roads, bronze-skinned as a summer night, the river steers, turns to velvet, and dreams of swallowing the stream that runs at your feet. Birds on the twigs pick out your next blues. So that's a poem by Sandra Jayat. She is a French manouche, which is both a word that means the people, and it also describes a particular Romani community in France. There are the manouche, who are in some ways more settled, and then there are the gens de voyage, the travellers, uh, who do constantly move around. And she is writing about one of our great musical figures, Django Reinhardt. Genius guitarist, jazz guitar, invented gypsy jazz, basically, in Paris in the 1930s alongside Stefan Grappelli. I'm sure people know Stefan Grappelli, the great jazz, Jewish jazz violinist. And the two of them together put together this extraordinary musical uh, team, really, which was, apart from Stéphane Grappelli, was all uh, French manouche. And they created hot jazz, hot gypsy jazz, as it was called, in the period just before the war. The extraordinary thing about Django is that in a fire as a child, he had his hand burnt, and these two fingers were welded together so he could only play guitar with these two fingers. So he had to invent a way of producing bar chords and different tunings 
in order to be able to move up and down the neck of the guitar very quickly. He also invented what is the kind of classic gypsy jazz guitar, which doesn't have a round circle, it's acoustic. It doesn't have a round circle in the center, it has a D shape. And that's why gypsy jazz guitarists have that very particular sound behind them. So that poem is about one of our great heroes, and we often look to that, and it's one of the themes of Romney poetry is our musical inheritance and the music that we've given to non-Romney communities. In the case here in Britain, you think, well, what is it that the gypsies and travellers, what's their music? And I can tell you, as a child growing up, our music was actually country and western because we'd lost it. But you can still find it, of course, because this is what Cecil Sharp went around collecting. Cecil Sharp was a musicologist in the early 20th century who was determined to find the origins of English folk music. And he went around the country collecting examples from Dorset all the way to Dumfries. He also went to the Appalachian Mountains because he worked out that the mountains had kept traditions which went back centuries and that there was still music being played there, which would have been heard in the countryside in Britain centuries before. So that music, which he collected, much of it came from Romney musicians and singers. There are still some. There's a strong tradition in Scotland. The Stuarts from Kirk Yeton still continue the tradition of being strong Romney singers. Uh, there is a traveller who's called Thomas McCarthy, who is one of the young people who sings. But by and large, most of English gypsy, Welsh gypsy music is to be found in what is now called folk music. So songs like Little, Mat uh, Little Matty, Muz Groves, Little Matty Groves. Um, of course, we all know Seven Gypsies All in a Row, and the, the Raggle Taggle Gypsies go. Um, but other songs too, there was one particular song about sheep stealing, I am a pressed lad whose fortune is bad. So all of those kind of songs, songs about transportation. There are poems about transportation and if you think back to Jimmy's story, he talks about and ended up in chains as galley slaves, deportees, outlaws and brigands. And that's of course because the period of the harshest treatment of Romney people in the British Isles meant that transportation as indentured slaves, as indentured servants, was one of the options. So that again, songs and poems about transportation, these are other themes that pop up in Romney poetry. There are also groups of Romney poets who produce poetry in Romanes. Romanes is our language, as I mentioned early, earlier, it's Indic in origins. Um, and that poetry, by people like Delia Grigore, who is a professor of creative writing at Bucharest University, but also a Romani poet writing in Romanes. Um, that poem is about an act of resistance and creativity. It's about maintaining the language for the community. It's about challenging the erosion of that language through television and broadcasting and these kind of things. So it's also about reclaiming part of our identity too, but it's, it's strongly about resisting the overall will to kind of erase us as a whole, which is still going on, despite the fact that we might say that the, the Holocaust was a distinct and discrete period of time, many East European, Central, Gov Central European governments, Southeast European governments, are desperately trying to assimilate and erase Romani communities of one sort or another, and forge them and force them into being new Hungarians, or new Czechs, or new Slovaks, or new Kosovans. So writing in Romanes, writing poetry in Romanes, and then reciting it in public is an act of strong resistance for the poets who do it. One of the greatest themes is always Romney poetry that looks back to the Holocaust. And we have our youngest person who's going to present a poem it is a dark poem, but it's a poem about the Romney Holocaust from one of the major political figures in the Romney rights movement. Our house is our streets, so big and black, so black and big. Petals of skull are hidden, strewn amidst the tall grass. Prayers rise up as 
Fall back beneath the ashes, beneath the dreams, searching for a door, a road out. House so big, house so black, lightless house, hopeless house. As I arrive at a house, my lips turn blue. These terror years are my path. Their names are the way stations. A house is outstretched, so big and black, so black and big. This is where the tears, this is where our tears flow, destroying our sight. This is where they crushed our pleas for no one to hear. This is where they turned us to ashes for the winds to scatter. Listen, Adam, listen, Simon, Eve and Mary to the 25,000 shadows that watch and follow me. These terror years are a path. Their names are the way station. House so big, house so black. House with no street, house with no address. Thank you. Well done. It's good, wasn't it? Thank you. So that's, that's the kind of poetry that comes out of uh, a specific urge, which is to make sure that people do not forget. One of the things about the Romani Holocaust is it's often called the Forgotten Holocaust. It was not recorded widely. It's not recognized widely. That's changed to some extent. People are now recognizing it. But it was only very recently, in the last few years, that somebody from our communities was appointed to the US Holocaust Commission. It's only very recently that members of the community have been attending the major Holocaust Memorial Day events that happen on 27th of January at Westminster. So this is something very new. That's one of the things that we're trying to um, encapsulate. And it's important to remember, not because we have this morbid fascination with trying to recall the dead, but because it is something that has been, yes, almost forgotten by the non romney people and often denied. And that's something we want to challenge and we want to, it's another act of resistance. So one of the other poems that we're going to get to, uh, to going to get to hear this evening is Jennifer's going to read it for us. My heart has been cut open, my blood drained in the name of freedom. What remains? Sweet music in my veins, ancient dance in my broken bones. Happy and sad, my spirit sails into the unknown, with no land, no home to call my own. Hopelessly searching through the past to find my people who scattered, like glass that shattered long time ago. Listen and you'll hear the song of longing. Look into the far distance beyond the horizon and there you'll see Dancing My Lonely Gypsy Soul by Nadia Hava Robbins. Um, I think in terms of the poetry of peoples of oppressed who, are under, who have, have been oppressed um, and the poetry of people who have been erased or attempted to be erased, there are always going to be these similarities in imagery and themes and notions of fragility whether it's um, it leaves often feature in, in uh, Jewish writers' poetry about the Holocaust or the Shoah, as it's called. Um, so leaves, that's one of the themes that props, crops up quite a lot. So there are the different communities have different ways of expressing notions of, of uh, fragility and the kind of tenderness of loss and all those things. But yes, I think these themes are all very... Yes, it's the common experience, I think which is true. So those notions and those ideas, one of the key things about the poem that Jennifer just read is that it also brings in this notion of the sharpness of joy and sorrow all at the same time. And again, that's one of the things that you find coming through Romney music. Frequently you will find that if you think about uh, flamenco and somebody like the great, sadly gone, Jose Galan, one of the most extraordinary Gitano flamenco singers, his music captured that terrible point of joy and pain at the moment of song. And that was all about the expression of his gypsy soul, as Nadia's poem calls it. That's about that idea that there is this moment of existence which can be captured in the lines of poetry or the lines of song and it can both bring tremendous joy, almost delirium, 
But again, this deep well of sorrow because of this terrible past, and it's how those two come together. One of the debates that goes on amongst Romani historians is should we be the kind of people who constantly harp on about the Romani Holocaust in terms of remembering and turning the community into a community of remembrance? And do we go down that political road? Are we going to forever be victims? Uh, to some extent, other groups have done that. Armenians spring to mind, for example, the political movement around uh, recognition of the Armenian genocide. Or do we reject that model and do we go for one that says this appalling thing happened, this tremendously long history of terrible oppression happened, but are we going to continue both remembering that terrible past but then trying to create some beauty and joy in this present and are we going to reject the idea we are just a community of remembrance and be a community that lives for the future? And some of what I think is captured, and I can't play it to you, but some of what is captured in what is happening in, the, the, there's a crossover going on between more formal poetry and recognizing the poetics of Romani poetry, these tropes and themes, and what's coming up from younger members of the community who engage with newer forms. What I mean by that is there are some young people like Tata Plinsen, who's out of Rinkeby, one of the satellites to Stockholm. Stockholm City Council in the 1960s and 70s did the thing where they went, right, all the brown and unwanted people, we shall push to these nice new developments all around the outside. And then we'll make sure that the middle of Stockholm, the lovely old part, is all still nice and ethnically Swedish. Um, now you've got these enormous satellites around, and this is the area where there's a huge amount of concern going on at the moment about gun crime and riots and all the rest of it, and why there was 20% vote for the Svenska Demokraterna in March, which means that there's now 20% of the Riksdag is fascist. However, one of the people that comes out of Frinkeby is Tata Prinsen, who is a young Rea Sander and traveler who use, he likes to use the old word Tatare, which is somewhat confrontational, both to his community and the outside community. But he's a rapper. And he raps over what are traditional polka tunes. He also plays the violin and stuff. So he's choosing an older form of, of uh, Romney music from Sweden, but he's rapping over the top of it. His work is very, very interesting and, and it's very charming. But then if you know Swedish and you listen to what he's saying, then of course there are all sorts of references to burning cars in the streets and riots and outside the door and all this kind of stuff. He's also interesting because when he, he is asked, so are you Swedish? What? Are you Roma? What? He says, no, 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 I'm from Rinkeby. And journalists will then say, well, what do you mean you're from Rinkeby? He says, I'm from the worldwide tribe of hip hop. Alienation is my nation. I connect to Istanbul, to Johannesburg, to New York, to Chicago. That's how he sees his identity. The other person, there are numbers of others, but the other person is somebody I know, because he's from Istanbul, and his name is Ceza, which means punishment in Turkish. He has a great sister who's a rapper as well. But Ceza works with um, a musician called Mercan Dede. He's a dervish, Mevlevi dervish, who is also a musical genius. He produces these wonderful compositions which bring in musicians from Serbia on brass instruments, Roma musicians. Um, and all kinds of other people from the Turkish tradition, the Roman La tradition of music. Um, and then Jezar raps over the top of them. And I only have it, I can only play it on my iPhone. So maybe I'll let that run while, while we're ending. But um, that seems to me to be where the kind of political expression, Jezar sees himself as Roman La and Turkish. Uh, he sees himself as Turkish first, actually, Turkish Muslim, then Romani. But what he strives for is not to be a minority, but to be equal under the law and before the constitution of Turkey. So he's looking to the secular state, which we currently may or may not have, let's face it. He's looking to the secular state as an equal partnership. We should be included. Very different approach to European Roma who are going for minority rights. But in that, we find the new forms of Romney poetry, I think. And we find new voices, young people, who are engaging in that. 
And I think I will leave that there and ask if anybody else has questions. Um, yeah, bearing in mind that um, people live across such a vast area of the world uh, and obviously education is relatively recent. Um, how long ago is it since your histories were handed down orally and when did you start to sort of collaborate and write things down? Um, actually, the, one of the issues about being an oral culture, as I'm sure other people who are from oral cultures, is not we're not literate, we're just non-literate, and our culture is around orality, um, is that the history doesn't get handed down, it gets lost, it gets erased quite quickly. Um, and one of the things that is also true is that our community has an enormous energy and impact in terms of advocacy and activism. There are lots of uh, young Romani people through the 90s through kind of sponsorship of um, uh, Open Society Foundations and other donors became lawyers and um, journalists. And, but historians are very, very few and far between in our community, especially ones who are actually trained to be historians. There are very, very few of us. So in that sense, Romney history is something that has been, it has been myth by and large for quite a long time. So basically, would you say that um, most Romney people are now bilingual at least? Can, can, can bilingual. most people like, or more so, more even? Yes. So yes, just to finish the bit about history is I think one of the things that was important for me to do was to actually go back to the sources and I'm talking about Persian sources, Arabic sources, Turkish sources, go into the archives, the Ottoman archives. Uh, one of the reasons why I was in Cairo was to look at the archives there. There are, there are lots and lots of places where you can find, and it's always, about, it's always written, material written about us, by, not by us. So you have to read it critically, but as a trained historian, that's what you need to do. And, and um, people have described what I've done as writing the new Romani history, basically. Um, so that's kind of been that process, and that's grown, because then other people have also taken up the issue of, from our community of writing our own history. We need to have our own voice, but we also need to be the kind of people who are beyond reproach about our scholarly rigour. We need to be not people who others will turn around and say, yeah, but you're just an activist masquerading as an academic. No, I'm an academic. It ha so happens I feel very responsible for working in the communities, but at heart I'm an academic and a trained historian. When it comes to languages, most Romani people are at least bilingual. They will speak mother tongue, which is Romanes. <coughs> they will also speak at least one other language, which is the majority language around them. And then because of migration and mobility, they're likely to speak a number of other languages. Um, so, for example, I, will speak, I speak Turkish, I speak some Azerbaijani now, because I've been in Azerbaijan, some Greek, some Arabic, etc., etc. Daniel speaks at least five different languages, as I know, and most of the community also do. So we need that, because wherever we go, we need to navigate and negotiate. So Romani people are enormously good linguists. I, yeah, I would interested about your own family history coming right. from the uh, uh, Romani background and when you say Irish traveller background. Yeah. Now I've heard um, uh, Irish people I know talking about the history of the Irish uh, traveller communities uh, at a sense that they perhaps grew up from the Irish people who lost their land under Cromwell, under plantation yeah. or whatever, I don't know. Is, is it, my question really is, is there a direct lineage from the people who came from Northern India through Byzantium, through that Western migration to the Irish traveller communities that my family would be familiar with? You've hit on the, what is the crucial difference between Irish travellers as opposed to Scottish gypsy travellers or Ray Sander or others. The Irish travellers, my father's people, are not Indian. They're Celtic. And they come from a group that you can see emerging in the 4th and 5th centuries in Celtic Island. Uh, they are a group of people who were originally called the Unlocked Suil, the walking people. Early medieval Ireland is basically a feudal society with local kings and then the high king at Tara. 
And it's quite an organized society in the sense that people have particular places. There were warriors, there were merchants, etc. Uh, farmers, of course, because they produce a surplus upon which everybody else lives. The Anluxuilan, they don't fit into that pattern. They are the cunning folk, the herbalists who wander. They are the blacksmiths who are moving for metalwork, these kind of things. So the walking people are these kind of, they are outsiders, but in early medieval Irish society, they do have these necessary functions. When Romans leave Britain, 410, the legions go, the Irish sweep across the sea and they establish the kingdom of David. The Welsh will tell you it was a Welsh kingdom. It wasn't, it's Irish. And of course, who, do you, who are the most mobile population with no ties to the land that you can bring across? It is these people. So we're talking about a group of people who go back to at least the early 5th century, possibly the 4th, but there's, we don't know, early 5th century, and who move into the British Isles literally after the Romans go. So they've been around a very long time, but they are not Indian. They do have a language, shelter, and it is an old form of Celtic. And there are four or five different dialects of shelter, some of which are often called, it's often called gammon as well, but that's a kind of backslang term. But yes, so old people, much older than the rest of us actually. Um, and however, the key thing is what's their shared historical experience? And their shared historical experience is almost exactly that of Romani people. The Cromwell connection is one that I, majority Irish people say because they want to say, yeah, but they're really us, aren't they? Well, no, they're not actually. And genetically, a number of studies have been done which prove that the Irish travellers are not genetically the same as Irish people. And the other thing to remember is that there has been a degree of intermarriage over the centuries because of constant travelling together. I'm not saying relationships between these two communities are hunky-dory, they're not always, but clearly partnerships are formed like my parents. So the Damari people, the oldest gypsy group, if you like, they wouldn't like me to use the word gypsy about them, but the Damari people, they come out of India in the 8th century with the first lot of Muslim invasions by the Umayyads. And they come out with a language which has masculine, feminine and neuter genders, like French or German. After 1000 AD, the neuter gender words are reassigned through the process of that linguistic transformation, which is also going on at the same point with Old English. Old English is shifting from a three-gendered language to a two-gendered language around the same point. And by the time we get to Caxton and, you know, and um, Canterbury Tales, which is not Caxton, I know, I should have said something else there, but Caxton is the printer. But anyway, um, by the time that happens, of course, all those words have been reassigned and with English as a two-gendered language, like Russian and many others. So Damari is the language which holds on to. Now, the question is why? Why does a language hold on to three genders in the face of what are shifting and changing patterns around it? Um, and the answer is because of an isolated community. The Damari are effectively a, an ethnic isolate within the wider Umayyad Caliphate. And it's in, although many of our traditions, even Romani traditions, stem from Islamic practices around pollution, taboo, cleanliness, these kind of things, we were never part of that because we were kept, our peoples were kept Hindus for very useful and specific and strategic reasons. You could use a group of Hindu troops to go and put down other Muslims if you were a Muslim ruler. You're not supposed to use Muslim troops against Muslim populations. Obviously, this didn't always happen, but that's why you kept these people around. So ethnic subunits were often part of the Umayyads or the Abbasids or later Islamic polities because they were very useful to be the bad people. And of course, you see the British do this in East Africa when they bring in the Pakistanis and or the people who will become Pakistanis. Um, and they use those to then be the buffer between them and the larger African population. So early Islamic power states were doing the same kind of thing when it came to these people. But yeah, three languages, uh, three genders. Thank you. Follows perfectly because I was just going to ask about religions amongst the Romani, and you've mentioned a little bit about that, not just now, but like Christian, Hindu, Jewish. You know, is there a yeah? 
what what what's the story about Romani? Are they just like everyone else, or is there a predominant line of tendency? To there isn't predominant lines and tendencies apart from the one of moving through territorial spaces and cultures whereby if you stay long enough you may cho make choices about becoming part of that. Um, what there is though, what the second bit to that answer is there are specificities which exist nowhere else. Amongst the Irish travellers for example, if we're thinking about the widest possible community, Irish travellers are extraordinarily devoted to Virgin Mary as Queen of the Gypsies. She was actually appointed Queen of the Gypsies by Giovanni Paolo in 1992 in a papal encyclical where he recognised that the Gypsies are a people without a nation and he actually, he, he didn't bother about the not Indian distinction, he just went, right, you're all Gypsies. Um, and he awarded uh, them to, as all of us, to the Virgin Mary. And they are, Irish travellers are wedded to the worship of the Virgin Mary to a point where it's probably quite idolatrous. And they are very, very Marian in their whole approach. And she's not just somebody who you kind of pray to. She's also a member of the family. I mean, it's like lives with you and protects you and makes the kids get better and all of that kind of stuff. So it's a distinct relationship. Muslim Rom who live in Turkey, there are parts of them who come from an old, old, old dervish tradition, the Kalenderis. So their relationship with Islam is... is kind of Sufi really, which is one of the reasons why Sunni Muslims in Turkey, even now, say you're not proper Muslims, you don't pray five times a day, you drink in the streets, etc. But there's a strong thread of Alevism, Shiism, amongst Turkish Roman law, and it goes back to these kind of days. And you'll find that Roman Catholicism is often different in its expressive forms, again focusing on saints and the Virgin Mary. The key thing is, though, what's the fastest growing Christian religion in Europe today? It is Philadelphia Pentecostalism, which is amongst the Romani communities. It's taking off enormously. There are a number of reasons. One is the liturgy has been translated. It's all in Romanes, except when the devil gets to speak. So when they're doing the sermon, it's fantastic. I love going to gypsy churches. Brilliant. When the, when the devil gets to speak in the morality plays, there's always a morality play halfway through, you know, you know this, is, this is why you should do it, because the devil gave. The devil always speaks English, <laughs> which I'm always delighted by. Um, the priesthood is all Romani, so it's autochthonous. It's governed and run by Roma people, Romani people. And it brings, the, the third reason why it's popular is because it's bringing together Roma, Gypsies, Irish travellers. It's bringing everybody together under kind of one big tent, as it were. So that was taught else makes it popular. The Romani language are, are, sorry, the Romani languages, there is only one Romani language. So just, uh, I'm sorry if I confuse anybody. There's one Romani language, 60% of it goes back to Hindi and Gujarati and Urdu. It's Indic origin. There are lots of different di dialects. There's possibly at the moment around 50 or 60 across the world. And the reason why they're variations is the same reason why British English is now a variation of the wider world of English speakers. There are little idioms which come up in, in my version of Romani as opposed to the one that Daniel speaks. We speak what is called pogadi chib. Chib means language. Pogadi is actually a Romani word for broken. So we speak a creole. Can you prove the grite grass? Sounds like English, doesn't it? And I'm actually asking you, can you take the horse down the road to the field, please? Whereas fully inflected Romanes, which is the kind of Romanes that Daniel and his community speak, is much less influenced by the dominant majority languages. But there are loan words. The Sinti, they are Romani. There is a kind of need, I think, amongst modern Romani writers and cultural producers, knowledge producers, to to maintain a distinctiveness in the face of what's become an overwhel almost overwhelming Roman nationalism. There is a strong body of Roman nationalists who are politically active and they dominate in these big organisations like uh, the European Roma Institute for Arts and Culture. And in the face of that, a lot of us are kind of stepping back and going, wait a minute, we're not all Roma. 
you know, and there's a diversity and a wonder to this diversity. So the Sinti say, no, we're from the Sind, hence Sinti, and we are geographically specific in our ancestry. We're, they even got it down to which raid Mahmud of Ghazna captured their ancestors. It was the third one when he crossed the Thar Desert and raided that temple. You know, there's the, that degree of kind of trying to separate out but maintain the commonalities but a distinctiveness. There's also Sinti in Germany. They were the ones who also suffered. There are Sinti in Poland uh, and in Austria. And a lot of anthropologists, not Romney, but anthropologists and ethnologists who work on us will say that British Romney Chows are originally Sinti, but I'm not sure about that. Anyway, thank you. Italians, yeah, Sinti. I think, bless you, by the way, Chokya Shah, may you live a long time. Um, and the answer to that is, may you be there to see it. Um, <laughs> we have all these little phrases too. Thank you so much for all of your interesting questions and thank you so much for listening. If you're interested in reading Romanes, there are quite a lot of books out there which you might want to look at. If you're interested in hearing Romanes, there are sound files at the Manchester University Romani Language Project. Also, you can find it by Googling, or better, duck, duck, going, because why do we use Google? Uh, if you Google Romlex, Romani lexicon, you will find sound files there. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the festival, please subscribe. Share this episode with others and leave a rating. Don't forget to mark your calendars as the Bradford Literature Festival returns for its 10th year from 28th of June to the 7th of July 2024.